You know, as a kid, I didn't only watch anime with little tiny baby fire breathing monsters in it. From anime to Animal Planet, I had a very eclectic taste. One interest from my childhood that I barely get a chance to talk to on this channel was my love for natural history documentaries. I mean, Animal Planet was just going off back in the day from Steve Irwin, the most extreme to a lesser extent animal face off. It was just a lot of stuff that got my brain turning. But the one thing that got my heart pumping was dinosaurs. Oh my God, I loved everything with dinosaurs. There's a whole slew of great yet outdated prehistoric programming from walking with dinosaurs, chased by dinosaurs, and for when you're ready to spice things up, before dinosaurs, walking with monsters. I got my copy of Walking with Dinosaurs at the Discovery Channel store. My favorite place to get ladybug habitats and the orb. But one year, for some reason, some relative gave me a stacked gift card to this place. And when I walked in there, the Discovery Channel store as my oyster documentary, the thing I chose to get was this. I don't know, something about the mouth, I guess. The future is wild. Sure looks like it. The Future is Wild is a 13 episode miniseries examining how life on Earth, you know, the one with the ocean, could continue to evolve. The series consults a wide range of experts on topics like geology, current animal population trends, the Earth's climate, and combines it with real examples from Earth's evolutionary history in order to create some pretty wild, though scientifically plausible creatures. Desert hoppers. That snail hops. The series is produced as if it were a real nature documentary using environmental footage combined with CGI creatures like Big Worm here. Of course, the question of our own descendants is never addressed, but that's okay because we got fish that fly like birds, penguins as big as walruses and big turtle. The future sure is wild. The Future's Wild hoped to launch an educational franchise with a cartoon, museum exhibits, educational tools that explain the real science behind the series, and even a manga. I'm not kidding. Don't tell me you're a fan of The Future is Wild unless you've read the manga. The Mega Squid arc hits differently on the page. On second thought, uh, ah, I don't really feel like making a video today. I'm just gonna put this on for you. I recorded it a few weeks back. Enjoy. between this and my regular YouTube videos is I wear a lab coat in these ones. On the job. The Future is Wild initially aired on Animal Planet in 2002, but it was based on a much earlier work, After Man, a zoology of the future by Dougal Dixon. Dixon is a geologist with a pretty massive interest in paleontology, which is what adults say when they want to substitute the phrase, I like dinosaurs. Dixon has written all the classic dino visual guides, many of which were aimed at children, which a child version of me absolutely read at some point. And he's still working today with more recent books like When Whales Walked. You learned something. <laughs> After Man was written in 1981. Stylistically, it's like a field guide about a speculative future 50 million years from now, where humans have gone away and many other of Earth's species have gone extinct, making life evolve in many unique ways. This is incredible. From fully aquatic hippos, pigs that look like elephants, and raboons, dinosaur-like predators that evolved from baboons. That's terrifying. After Man is a masterclass in imaginative thinking. I think the creative exercise itself is interesting with all of its scientific limitations rather than speculating on whether or not these animals will ever actually exist. Some of these are cool, like a flower-faced bird that catches bugs looking for pollen and a giant terrestrial predatory bat which are just the most terrifying thing I've ever seen. If those were real, I would just run up to it and let it eat me because I would not want to live in a reality where this thing existed kind of terrifying. But then there's my absolute favorite, the Kifa. What's he doing there? The Kifa is a high canopy descendants of monkeys who have very highly secure systems in their trees. But what's the security for? 
Why, the Striger, a cat that can now climb up trees like a monkey. Look at him, he's grooving. After Man was a pretty big success in America, selling tons of copies and even earning a Hugo Award nomination. It even received two sequels, The New Dinosaurs, a speculative piece about how dinosaurs could have continued to evolve, and nearly a decade later, Man After Man. Oh, this thing is horrible. It's a speculative piece about how humans and genetically altered humans continue to evolve and thrive in a dramatically changed world post world altering climate change. <laughs> Fucking zoinks. The only thing keeping this forbidden knowledge from being spread to humanity even more is the fact that it was never reprinted and to get a copy it's gonna set you back about $800. <laughs> I hope they never <laughs> reprint this. Yeah, I bet you didn't guess he was that small, did ya? So while After Man was a big success in America, it was an even bigger success in Japan. Being adapted for a half hour TV special with stop motion animation showing the actual creatures and even an anime, but I could only find the intro. I would love to see more footage of this. After Man eventually had its film rights purchased by DreamWorks and DreamWorks was like, eh, I don't really feel like making a movie. So then Discovery Channel was like, hey, can we make a TV series? And DreamWorks was like, no. So with Dougal as a sort of creative consultant, Discovery Channel went on to make their own history of the future, set in different times than After Man so they wouldn't interfere with the continuity. You gotta keep Kifa in the continuity. Alongside Dougal, 16 different scientists from different fields worked as consultants to make sure the science was as close to plausible as possible. And you may recognize some of them. First, there's Letitia Aviles, who you may know from her work, Colony Size and Individual Fitness in the Social Spider, and Nell. Oh, Simus. The all-star cast does not stop there. They were able to get paleobotanist Dr. Bruce Tiffany. That's right, the very same Bruce Tiffany who wrote the use of geological and paleontological evidence in evaluating plant phylogeographic hypotheses in the Northern Hemisphere territory in the International Journal of Plant Sciences. And just when you think they couldn't round out this perfect all-star cast, they got Professor William Gilly, 4,922 citations. How did they land him? He wrote Behavioral Ecology of Jumbo Squid in relation to Oxygen Minimum Zones and its sequel, Onshore Offshore Movement of the Jumbo Squid on the Continental Shelf. They didn't have to flex that hard with their cast. Oh my god. Remember those squids for later. The show requires some basic fourth grade science recollection. And while explaining this topic to my friends, I realized not everyone grew up watching these over and over again and now spend every night rewatching the same PBS Eons videos with Hank Green. Hey, Hank Green. Dr. Manhattan's dong is blue and six feet long. So I'm gonna explain some of the necessary scientific concepts in the least scientific way possible. First, the scientists in the future is wild rely on larger, more predictable changes the Earth will make geologically, such as the changing faces of land on Earth due to millions of years of continental drift and the Earth's ever-changing climate. So we know land moves, and we know sometimes the Earth is hotter or colder. Then from there, the future's wild team looked through evolutionary history in order to find examples of real animals who adapted to similar scenarios. All right, let's talk about convergent evolution. So animals live together in habitats, and all the animals who live in that habitat have certain roles called ecological niches. Niche can also be pronounced niche, so stop being a little bit. Simply put, an ecological niche is what that animal eats and who eats it. If, if anybody's gonna eat you, nobody's eating this big turtle. And so convergent evolution is a phenomena that happens in nature when different species of animals who inhabit a similar or the same ecological niche adapt adopt a similar or the same body plan because it's what works best for the job. It's like, hey, I'm a crocodile, I'm an aquatic predator. Whoa, all of you guys have long snouts too? You all eat fish as well? 
We're not closely related on the evolution family tree, but we've all figured out how to adapt these same designs. So then when an animal species goes extinct and leaves their ecological niche empty, that's a source of food that nobody's going after. And with a lack of competition, life finds a way. All right, let's come up with a hypothetical example. Let's say a lion is born with this random genetic mutation and elongated mouth. What a freak, am I right? That lion can't even chew. Weird lion will probably be dead soon. Lions gotta chew. Well, anyways, Thanos is back. And this time, instead of saying, you should have gone for the head, he snaps his fingers and says, in a while, crocodile, and then snap. All the crocodiles in Africa have disappeared. Bad news if you're a crocodile, but good news if you're a weird lion. Weird lion starts eating all the fish in these ponds because no big predators are around to prevent it from doing so. Because it now has an adequate food supply, it's more likely to mate and produce more weird lions. And over time, somewhere in between 10 days and 100 billion years, the lions start having other random genetic mutations that just so happen to help their new found niche as an aquatic predator. Webbed toes, stubbier legs, and a slick new tail to help it swim. We have a catadile. And hey, doesn't that thing look an awful lot like those weird lizards that used to live here? What were they called? So with more scientific guidance than me, each episode examines a futuristic ecosystem alongside evolved animals and plants and how they fit into new ecological niches. And some of these animals are interesting. All right, the first arc in the future is wild is five million years in the future, Ice World. There's four episodes overall examining an earth where temperatures have lowered enough for peak glacial activity. Maybe some bear-sized weasels, I don't know, trying to eat a big furry rodent, a shag rat. If a shag rat gets tired, ill or weak, and falls behind the others, it's in serious trouble. A shag rat? Why do you have to call it that? Oh, and this one's my favorite. The gannet whale, a cestacean-sized penguin, because they all went extinct. Recycle. There are some neat animals like the caraciller, a giant flightless predatory bird, the babukari, ground-dwelling monkeys, and the death cleaner, giant predatory bats that developed better senses to match that of predatory birds. And now while the five million year arc does well to establish the science, it's inherently a little less interesting than the rest, just because it's so close to our own present. But just like another monster anime, the show really picks up in its second arc, 100 million years in the future, Hot House. This earth is primarily covered in water and even land is covered in large swampy inland seas. And it's here we get neat animals like the lurkfish, a descendant of electric catfish that have super strong electrical shock. That water electric typing serves it well against its arch nemesis, the swampus, the f***ing swampus. Remember the Swampus for later. The Swampus is an example of one of the cooler aspects of the future is wild. Like the Gannet Whale, it's an example of convergent evolution, where a different species, such as an octopus, evolves similar adaptations to a fish like a mudskipper. The Swampus also has some light venom, which doesn't do it much good against a lurk fish, but dang, this juvenile Toraton has no chance. The Swampus can defend itself. <laughs> The Swampers has a deadly bite. Holy heck, would you look at these absolutely huge tortoises? I like the Toraton. The adults are enormous. The biggest animals that have ever walked on the face of the planet. 120 tons. That's bigger than even the biggest dinosaur. Well, yeah, of course it sounds amazing. You made it. Sometimes it really bothers me how the scientists talk about these animals like they actually existed. Like, as an eight-year-old watching this, I sort of thought the predictions they were making were in fact, fact, and, and yeah, maybe that's on me for being a dumbass eight-year-old with no higher education. I should have reconsidered my position. But nowadays, seeing these distinguished individuals talking about these creatures like they're actually real is, kind of funny, but in a very heartwarming way. Like seeing all of these people with PhDs, more PhDs than you could count, get giddy and excited about these fictional imaginary animals is really heartwarming. Sometimes I am laughing at the future is wild, but we're all laughing together. It's like, yeah, the Toraton sounds amazing when you describe it as a real animal that actually exists, but it doesn't exist. It's fictional and you made it. But guess what? Tor 
Zaraton's not so amazing in my future. In my fictional future, my cat Pumpkin is the only species left alive on Earth. And a descendant of Pumpkin, Big Pumpkin, is about four inches taller than the Toraton and weighs 15 pounds more. I don't care that science doesn't support a cat getting that big, herpetologist Mike Linney. In my future, science doesn't exist. My future is wilder. Put that under your microscope and smoke it. <coughs> Oh, it's a multicellular organism. This is the Poggle. It looks so sad. The Poggle is the last mammal ever. All the rest have died out. The last of the mammals. It lives underground with a bunch of spiders, and it does some organizing for the spiders sometimes. It's tough, but it's honest work. Why does it look so sad? When the workday is done, it gets eaten by the spiders. I guess that's just what it means to be a Poggle. I love watching The Future is Wild because I feel like in nature documentaries, it's like, you see an animal eat another animal and it never feels good. But in the future's wild, it's all constructed. So all of the cruel things like the poggle serving the spiders just to be devoured by them is a creation of the people who worked on this series. It's cruel. Unlike many of the other special effect heavy nature documentaries from this time, like Walking with Dinosaurs, I think The Future is Wild particularly hasn't aged well. The show uses a combination of talking head segments in front of 3D models that are green to make them look futuristic, I guess. But watching this on my 4K TV looks awful. This was definitely not produced to be seen this clearly. It's outdatedness does add to the charm for me, but I can see how this series hasn't been reprinted as many times as say something like Walking with Dinosaurs. This is just birdemic quality at times. I mean, look at this giant squid grab the bird out of the sky. I didn't realize I put on Sharktopus. But despite the technical limitations, the series is still interesting because of its imaginative efforts to explain real scientific concepts. And that imagination is on display best in the series third and final arc 200 million years in the future new world. In the far future, planet Earth looks real different. Like, what the f***? Post-mass extinction, 95% of life on Earth has been wiped out. Poggle, what the hell did you do? But this eradication also includes many of Earth's familiar faces. The fish are gone. The fish. And mammals are gone, but life finds a way. In place of fish, we got big plankton. Sharks have Wi-Fi now, apparently. And birds. They're gone, haven't heard that name in a hundred million years. But in the place of birds, we have the worst thing I've ever seen. They've evolved completely separately from a very different ancestor. Flish, as the name suggests, have evolved from fish. I hate it, but the forest flish in the next episode is better. I watched this show as a kid. That was like 15 years ago. To me, that is a lifetime ago. But geologically speaking, I am no more closer to ever seeing a flish now than I was then. And that makes me very sad. Look at this squid with an 8K retina display. It can change all different kinds of colors. Hold up, squids. Well, Professor William Gilly, you did it. I hope you're happy. You and your love for cephalopods created one of the most cursed things I have ever seen. In the final episode of The Future is Wild, the conclusion to the 200 million years New World arc, we meet the series' final boss, the big bad, the terrestrial Mega Squid. Mega Squid is bigger than any animal alive today. It walks on the ground and it eats anything it wants, stretching out its gross tentacles to grab what it likes. Suddenly, Mega Squid makes a mistake and eats the magic goo, and the magic goo tries to take over Mega Squid's brain. Also, it's not magic. It's Some of those cells migrate up to the brain, inflame the brain, and alter the behavior of the Mega Squid. They make sure to let you know that anything ridiculous is real. It happens in nature. If magic goo can't defeat Mega Squid who can defeat him? And just when you think you can get a leg up on Mega Squid, he activates his special ability, Base Boost. It has a Base Boost. Oh no, Mega Squid got the baby Squibbin, a tree-dwelling squid who's evolved a similar lifestyle to monkeys. But that's okay, the Squibbins team up to take down Mega Squid. They get their baby back, but Mega Squid gets away. A thrilling finale to the future. The series ends with an ominous yet very hopeful look into the future. Humans are gone. Nature is healing. Intelligent squids 
will inherit the if earth. If there's going to be continued development of further intelligence after 200 million years, I certainly believe it will be the cephalopods. Uh, the series implies the next major sentient species Earth will have are big brain squids. I'm f***ing here for it. Despite airing nearly 20 years ago, the future is wild. It's kind of still an active brand and it even still has its fans. An animated show aired a few years later. It's fun, but it cuts out a lot of the science that I think really makes these animals interesting. After Man actually received a reprint a few years ago with some of the science updated to fit modern discoveries. And talk of an After Man movie or a Future is Wild remake pops up every few years. And for the first time since 2002, new time Times from the future are expected to be examined in a potential Future is Wild VR project. Despite some of the silly aspects to this series, I think the idea continues to persist because creatively, speculative evolution is really genuinely very interesting. The Future is Wild is fun! Yeah, seeing these distinguished professors talk about such silly creatures paired with the outdated CGI makes the project a bit cheesy, but it's so much fun. It's just so heartwarming seeing all of these scientists with, you know, college professor level charisma get giddy and excited about this really fun project. It's probably the most fun they've had in years. Even if those morons didn't think to make the Toraton just a few you inches taller. I guess that PhD can't buy you imagination. I got all the imagination here. Ending joke. No, that's how I ended my last video. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If this is your first video of mine, subscribe, comment down below. Tell me what other weird nature-esque documentaries you'd like me to look at. Just comment down below. And thank you so much to Amy Waters for creating that cover of the eyewitness theme. It went above and beyond my expectations. And if you like that track, Amy also has a new album out, Cosmos of the Soul. And I guarantee you, you will like it if you like that track. It is amazing. Uh, other than that, you can follow me on social media. The links are in in the description down below. Uh, have a good day. I'm tired. I'm stressed. I will see you soon.